Well, thank you so much. Uh, Candy and I are delighted to be here in, in a room full of conservative people. Uh, you know, I grew up in Detroit, very liberal place. Boston, very liberal place. New Haven, Connecticut, very liberal place. Ann Arbor, Michigan, very liberal place. Came to work in Baltimore, very liberal place. So I was a liberal. And, uh, and then, and then I did something liberals weren't supposed to do. I listened to a conservative. I listened to Ronald Reagan. And I said, he doesn't sound like a horrible racist person. He sounds just like my mother. <laughs> and I started making that transition uh, at that point. But you know, the most important thing when it comes to conservatism is recognizing the role of God in our lives. That is the most important thing. And he is so amazing, you know. I think about my life as a youngster. You know, I had a horrible temper. And uh, some of you probably know the story of when I tried to stab another youngster with a knife and he had on a metal belt buckle on the knife blade saved him, the buckle saved him. But isn't it amazing how God takes a street knife meant to harm people and replaces it with a scalpel to save lives? <laughs> and not only that, but God has a sense of humor. I'll tell you, because... Uh, after that stabbing incident, that day I started reading from the book of Proverbs. And I start every day and end every day reading from the book of Proverbs until this very day. And the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon. Well, my middle name happens to be Solomon. So he knew I was going to have that great affinity. But remember what happened in Solomon's life when he became king that brought him great fame? Two women claimed to be the mother of the same baby. And what did he do? He advocated dividing the babies. Well, isn't that when I became very well known when I divided babies? <laughs> so he knows what he's doing. But it is so vitally important for organizations like this one to counter the propaganda that is put forth by the leftists who want our young people. You know, what does the Bible say? It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Well, guess what? Our enemies know that, too. And that's why Vladimir Lenin said, give me your children to teach for four years, and the seed that I sow will never be uprooted. That's why they're so interested in getting into our schools and indoctrinating our kids and convincing them that they're victims. You know, if you believe you're a victim, you are one. You know, if there was anybody who could claim to be a victim, it was my mother. You know, she came from a very large rural family, had less than a third grade education, bounced around from house to house, got married at age 13, trying to avoid that horrible situation. Years later, discovered that her husband was a bigamist. There she was trying to raise two young sons in the city by herself. And she never claimed victimhood. And she never let us be victims. And she never let us make excuses. If we ever made an excuse, the next thing out of her mouth was the poem called Yourself to Blame. And what a difference it made. And she prayed. That was the important thing. She prayed for wisdom because my brother and I were such horrible students. And, you know, God gave her the wisdom, at least in her opinion. My brother and I didn't think it was wise at all. I mean, turning off the TV and making us read books, what kind of wisdom was that? In today's world, we would have called social services. But, uh, but we had to read the books. And it really opened up a whole new world for me because... We were very poor, but between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere, I could do anything, I could be anybody. I started reading about surgeons and scientists and entrepreneurs and explorers, and 
I began to realize as I read those stories that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. It's not somebody else. It's not some circumstance. It's somebody else. And what a difference that made in my life. And, you know, I got to the point where if I had five minutes, I was reading a book. I went from being the dummy to being the bookworm. All the kids who used to laugh and call me names were coming to me saying, Benny, Benny, how do you work this problem? And I'd say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. I was, uh, I was perhaps a little obnoxious, but boy, it made such a big difference and such a big difference in the way that I felt throwing away that victim mentality. And you know, we need to really be courageous as we battle that. You know, a lot of people think the right way, but the problem is they're not courageous. They'd rather stand in the corner looking at their shoes than to speak up for what they believe. But we need to be willing to speak up. Somebody has to speak up. And have you noticed that the left always says, you can talk about anything, but don't talk about religion or politics. That's exactly what we should be talking about. (laughs) They do their best work undercover as they try to deceive people and dumb down the population. And we need to shine the light on them because I think it will make a big difference for our kids. And we need to, to help our young people to understand that they have a very proud heritage in this country. I mean, right now, many people say that young black males are an endangered species. Why? Because they are more in prison than they are in college. Because homicide is the number one cause of death. And it didn't have to happen because anybody of any nationality could have taken that six-year-old black boy and walked down the streets of this city, given him a black history lesson he would have never forgot. Could have started by pointing to his shoes and saying it was Jan Matzliger, a black man who invented the automatic shoe lasting machine, revolutionized the world of shoes, and go out into that clean street. Charles Brooks, a black man who invented the street sweeper, those big machines with the brushes on them. And down that street comes a big refrigerated tractor trailer truck and you can tell them that it was um, Frederick Jones. Jones. There's my wife. Okay. (laughs) Frederick Jones, who invented the air conditioning system for trucks, later adopted for airplanes, boats, and trains. And it comes to a stop at the red light. It was Garrett Morgan who invented the traffic signal. You can tell how he invented the gas mask, saved lots of lives during the war. While you're talking about the war, Henrietta Bradbury, a black woman who invented the underwater cannon, made it possible to launch torpedoes from submarines. He walked past the hospital. Charles Drew, his contributions to blood banking, understanding the function of blood plasma. Daniel Hale Williams, the first successful open heart surgery in the world, had an operative mortality rate of less than 1.5%. You look up at the surgical light, Thomas Edison, you didn't know he was black, did you? Well, he wasn't, but but his right-hand man, Louis Latimer, was. And you can tell how Louis Latimer came up with the filament that made the light bulb work for more than two or three days, invented the electric lamp diagram, the telephone for Alexander Graham Bell, was a tremendous inventor in his own right. And then you walk past the railroad track, and you talk about Andrew Beard, the automatic railroad car coupler spurred on the Industrial Revolution, Elijah McCoy, the automatic lubrication system for locomotive engines, had so many inventions, people are always trying to imitate them. And they would say, is that a McCoy? Is that the real McCoy? You've got racist people like David Duke talking about the real McCoy, don't even know who he's paying homage to. And I'm just barely scratching the surface. I can go on for a long time talking about those contributions. But I'll tell you what's really great about America. I can take that same walk down the street for virtually any nationality and point out great things that were contributed by that nationality. And that's how America became great so fast because we had so many people with so many talents. Our diversity is not a problem, it is a blessing. (laughs) And we have to be the ones who spread the word. And if you're black and you're a conservative, they hate you. 
because the, the leftists, they work best in darkness. And they don't want you to know what's going on. They don't want you to know, for instance, that the Democrats were the party of slavery. The Republican Party was founded as an abolitionist party. It was the Republicans who aided the freedmen. It was the Republicans who pushed for the Civil Rights Act, and for the Voting Rights Act. And who was it who divided the black population of the slaves? Think about it. They would tell the slaves in the house, you're better than the ones in the yard. And the ones in the yard, you're better than the ones in the field. Why? Because they had to keep them divided. They had to keep them fighting each other. And then after slavery was over, the light-skinned ones, you're better than the middle-skinned ones, and you're better than the dark-skinned ones. Keep them fighting each other, not being able to get together. And it just has continued to this very day as they try to divide blacks who have different opinions about politics. They don't want us to get together, amalgamate that power, and become a, a vital force. But we have to make sure that we get the word out there, we spread it, and, and does it sometimes mean that people will say mean things and take jabs at you? Yes, it does. But you know the way I kind of look at it? Against the backdrop of eternity, what is a little bit of discomfort here? It means nothing. We don't have to worry about that. All we have to do is worry about our relationship with God. And stop worrying about those people who say separation of church and state. There's, that's not in the Constitution. And, you know, our Constitution, our Constitution is a magnificent document. And I can tell you from working with uh, President Trump that he understands it. And this is a man who had tons of money, who was already as famous as anybody could be. He didn't need this. And... Uh, I remember watching an interview with Oprah 30 years ago, and she said, would you ever run for president? He said, no, not unless I thought the country was going off a cliff. And he put himself out there. Think if he had not won and Hillary had won, and we had three more Supreme Court justices that were left us, we would already be over that cliff. And, you know, the Lord provides different kinds of leadership for different times. In the Bible, he used all kinds of people. And you think about King David, who murdered, who committed adultery, who did all kinds of things. God said, he's a man after my own heart, because he repented and he sought redemption from God. Donald Trump will do that as well. I talked to him. And those people who say, I like his policies, but I, I just can't stand them. I couldn't possibly vote for somebody like that. Well, you know, I say, what if you were sick, you had a terrible disease, and it required a skillful surgeon? Which surgeon would you rather have? The one who has terrible bedside manner but has a tremendous record, or the one who has a wonderful bedside manner but kills everybody? You know? <laughs> so, God, God will provide us with what we need. Amen. God loves us. We love him. He will give us what we need, but we have to do our part. Thank you very much.